Well, let's begin with a closer look at what's unfolding in Syria right now. So for the last 11 months, thousands in Syria have been protesting the government led by Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Thousands apparently have also reportedly been killed. But it's hard to know exactly what's happening on the ground there since very few journalists have been able to get in. In the last few days, though, that violence has increased dramatically. And over the weekend, the U.N. Security Council met to vote on a draft resolution condemning the Syrian government's crackdown and urging Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to step down. Now, 13 countries voted in favor of that measure, but Russia and China vetoed it, saying a change in government should come from the inside. It was a decision uh, that many people have very different opinions about, but here is what U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Susan Rice, has said. Mr. President, the United States is disgusted that a couple members of this council continue to prevent us from fulfilling our sole purpose here, addressing an ever-deepening crisis in Syria and a growing threat to regional peace and security. For months, this council has been held hostage by a couple members. Now today, the United States closed its embassy in Damascus, and according to the State Department, all American personnel have now departed the country. Now, if you've been watching the mainstream media at all today, you've probably heard phrases like Russia and China blocking progress or standing in the way of a chance for change, or that the blood will be on the hands of those two countries. But there is a lot more to this story. And for that, I want to go now to Pepe Escobar, a cor correspondent for Asia Times. Pepe, a Secretary of State Hillary Clinton calls what's happening in Syria a travesty and is pointing to the situation in the city of Horns in which reportedly more than 200 people were killed as a reason for immediate involvement. What do you have to say to this? Well, look, I would start paraphrasing Susan Rice. I would say that the international community, the real one, not uh, NATO and the six uh, Persian Gulf monarchies in the GCC, is disgusted by the travesty of repeated U.S. vetoes in the U.N. whenever the topic of Israel comes. So Israel, the U.S. can veto anything regarding Israel. Israel can keep uh, killing uh, men, women, and children in Palestine. But obviously, Russia and China, they cannot block a resolution that imposes regime change in Syria. So let's uh, have this straight in our minds. So, Second, very important, this is a much, much bigger picture. It's not only Syria related to U.S. and NATO, the GCC, the Persian Gulf monarchies, and Russia and China. This is about who is going to control the Middle East from now on. And Syria is immediately linked to what's happening in Iran. So basically what we have here is the U.S. with their NATO partners, in fact, the only two of them, uh, uh, France and Britain. The six Persian Gulf monarchies, they are Sunni, hardcore Sunni in the Persian Gulf, against Iran, against Syria, and the link between Iran and Syria with Russia and China. So basically, in the long run, in the, long run the big picture is, let's block Russia from having a naval base in the Mediterranean with Syria, having a close connection with the Middle East. Let's block Iran from having a close energy partnership with China. And in the end, let's, we, the West, block Russia and China from being closely related to the Middle East and Southeast Asia. This is the big picture. So what we're going to see from now on is a radicalization. And that's already happening. So this means uh, the rebels in Syria, the Free Syrian Army, will keep being armed and weaponized by not only Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which is already happening for months now, but especially by the United States, and in terms of intelligence as well, and in terms of the NATO base that it's in southern Turkey, near the border with Syria, a command and control center of NATO will be much more important. 
and in terms of weapons being smuggled through the Lebanese border as well. Everybody knows these things in the Middle East. Maybe people in the, in the American mainstream media don't know. Well, Pepe, in the let me stop you for just yeah. a second because you, you said a lot of interesting things and I want to um, just touch upon a few of them. Um, okay. You were talking about the relationship between Russia and Syria, the relationship between China and Syria. Uh, I know one of the popular analyses given today regarding Russia's decision to veto was, you know, that it sells arms to Syria. And so it was in Russia's economic interest. Uh, I want to play, though, what the foreign Minister of Russia, Sir, of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, said, and then we can talk about it. Okay. Some Western comments on the outcome of the UN Security Council vote on Syria sound indecent and almost hysterical. In this connection, I can't but remember the saying that those who are angry are rarely right. With these hysterical statements, attempts are being made to create a false picture of what is really going on in Syria. And what's really happening is that there are several, and not just one source of violence in Syria. What is your response to that? Lavrov is absolutely correct. In fact, you know what he did? He sent all the Russian amendments to the Arab League concocted and then British, French, US redacted resolution to Hillary Clinton personally. So Mrs. Clinton could analyze the amendments and then have a more uh, even-handed resolution because the resolution is not blaming, in fact, an armed insurrection as well. Can you imagine if you have a mid-sized city in the United States controlled by an insurrection? How do you think the response of the U.S. government would be? So and what is fact, it then that, the, that Russia and China um, are asking for in terms of a change of language, in terms of uh, different wording in a resolution? The different wording would be that both parties are, uh, in fact, uh, let's put it this way, guilty of violence and in, in various cases, extreme violence, not only forces allied with the government, not necessarily the Syrian army, sometimes the Syrian army, but uh, the gangs that work for the, the Syrian government, the Shabiha. And on the other side, the Free Syrian Army and a lot of mercenaries, some of them imported from the Gulf countries, they are advising the Free Syrian Army. The Free Syrian Army is basically a small collection of, of gangs, of patrols, of uh, contingents, like 5, 10, 15 people maximum. Uh, some of the factors of the Syrian army, but uh, there are a lot of uh, advisors from abroad as well. So when the Syrian government says that this is a, an insurrection uh, funded by foreign powers, they are basically correct to a certain extent. There is an indigenous popular movement against the Bashar al-Assad government. It's true, but this, they have been completely hijacked by these army, these armed operations financed from abroad because the agenda of all these players is completely different from the so-called Syrian people Pepe. that uh, the NATO just discovered yesterday, in fact. Speaking of armed operations financed from abroad, a lot of people are pointing to what's happening in Syria and the attempt at this resolution. They're, they're making a lot of comparisons with Libya, and I think uh, in a lot of ways those are legit comparisons. You have uh, the equivalent of sort of a civil war going on in inside the country. Uh, the U.S. kind of stands back, then the U.S. decides to get involved, call for the leaders to step down, um, and they start wanting to fund uh, not a ground war, but uh, they want to fund change. Uh, do you think that, that the, this comparison with Libya is correct and that one of the reasons that China and Russia didn't want to get involved was last time they abstained from the vote? Uh, is it possible that maybe they want to prevent another Libya? You're absolutely right. In fact, they are trying to prevent Libya remixed or Libya 2.0. Uh, don't forget that the Syrian uh, National Council, which is basically based in Turkey and in Paris, the leader is a Paris sociologist who's been living in Paris for years. And people in Libya tell me that they don't trust him because he's an exile. He doesn't know what's really going on in Syria for the past two or three decades, for that matter. It's the same thing as the Libyan, remember the Libyan Transnational Council. And don't forget what happened to Libya. And Russia and China, they look at it and they see it right away. Now Libya is that country governed by the, the people formerly known as rebels, and in fact is a country run by militias. All right. Most of them Islamic, Islamist aligned militias. They cannot even organize a functional government in Tripoli. 
Okay. Can you imagine this expanded to a very complex country like Syria in the middle of a powder keg in the Middle East? And this is what Russia, especially Russia, but also China, have been pointing out to the West. All right, Pepe Escobar, correspondent with the Asia Times, joining us from Bangkok, Thailand.